The lesson isn't always necessarily in the success. The lesson is in the failure. Well, hello, and welcome to the Scar Tissue Podcast. I hope I didn't scare you. Today, I'm joined by the amazing Annabelle Chauncey. Now, she's the type of person that makes you want to be a better person. She's the recipient of the Medal of the Order of Australia, the 2015 Young Woman of the Year, and the co-founder of the School for Life Foundation, a not-for-profit organization working in rural Uganda where they help empower communities to help themselves and create new opportunities with education at its core. It's an organization that's all about hand up and not hand out. It's amazing. Annabelle in this interview, as she is in life, is absolutely fearless. She's okay with being vulnerable and sharing her mistakes. She's okay with revealing how hard it can be to deal with rejection day after day. She doesn't shy away from her shortcomings and acknowledges her sacrifices. But the most remarkable thing about Annabelle and what comes out in this interview is her tenacity, her dog-like hunger to succeed for a purpose greater than herself. And it's that hunger that makes every challenge or setback she faces just another lesson and another chapter in a much more meaningful story a story that she does share a part of in this interview. The conversation itself takes off as soon as Annabelle sits down, so bear with me. I didn't even have a chance to hit record, so what I'm going to do is drop you straight in to Annabelle introducing School for Life. Enjoy this episode, which I already know is going to be one of my favorites, and hopefully it's one of yours as well. So everyone knows who who listens to the podcast, tell us about School for Life. School for Life is a non-profit organisation. We build quality education centres in rural Uganda. Mm. So we've built two primary schools that filter graduates into one larger secondary school. But they're really hubs for the whole community. So it's not just about the primary and secondary education. It's about uplifting entire communities. So we provide clean drinking water, healthcare, vocational training, adult literacy, the services are quite rounded yeah. and we aim to affect, you know, that have that ripple effect of education throughout. So we're affecting now, we've got 680 students from preschool through to senior one um, and we're estimating that we're touching the lives of between two and 4,000 people. So we're having a big impact now um, and it's incredible just to see how strongly and deeply valued education is in Uganda. Mm. The kids just love it. The parents are coming wanting to learn. You know, many of them are illiterate. They never got the opportunity to go to school. So, yeah, so School for Life is really about empowering local people to help themselves. I love it. Yeah. It sounds like it's a model that empowers the hearts and the hands. Absolutely. And the minds as well. Yeah, right? yeah. And I very much am in the background over there. That's you by know, design? By design. 100%. So I've got 120 staff over in Uganda. Mm. Um, only one is Western. And um, we are basically just focused on providing capacity development to ensure that the local people run this mm. and own this for themselves. Did you start off wanting to be like that? Yes. Or did you start off? So, okay. No, I was, I was set on that from the beginning. And that that's in some ways our point of difference. How did you come to realise that that was the way we had to be like for this to work I need to play it this way sustainability has to be at the forefront of conversation from the very beginning when you're yeah. starting a business I think and particularly when you're starting a business when you're dealing with other people's lives yeah and we were never going to develop something sustainable if we had to have westerners running it all the time mm. so that was really the big key component for that decision but also just because you know I believe that Um, you need your own role models and I am a foreigner Mm. to the Ugandans you know I'm I stick out like a sore thumb you know I'm I'm different I have a very different experience of life Um, so you know there are times when decisions uh, you know are made from the ground upwards and I don't necessarily agree with them but these are their schools you have to let it go. Yeah. Say it and let it go. Yeah. And um, that's been amazing. It's It really teaches you how to listen. <laughs> and is the problem getting better over there? Is uh, yeah. things getting better over there? Yeah, it is. Um, every time I go, the development seems to have increased. So I do notice significant change. I mean, particularly uh, where we're operating, it's just over time, over the last 10 years, um, huge difference. 
So, yeah, it is making a difference. But I think, again, sometimes we do take an approach that, like, the problem's too big, it's Africa, how do I do anything that's mm. not going to just dissipate into the into oblivion? For me, it's um, it's individuals. You know, you are dealing with an individual's life. Yeah. So, um, chunk, so it down. chunk it down. Yeah. Yeah. Like, think big, but start small. Just for my own reference, uh, yeah. how big is the problem over there? Like, the, the, the education Huge. problem? So... We have um, 42 million people living in Uganda. It's the same size as the state of Victoria. Oh, my God. 56% of the population is aged under 14. How So the, the death rate must be Yes, yeah, so ridiculous. life expectancy is 56, and 50% of kids complete primary school. Oh goes gosh. down to 13% complete secondary, 3% complete tertiary. So it's a huge education issue, huge. So... How did you start School for Life? You went to Africa. I went to Kenya and Uganda for about four months when I was um, just halfway through my uni degree. Right. And I just went over there and, yeah, I just became entranced. Um, well, and why, why did you go over there in the first place? Well, I, I mean, just I Bali wanted to do – yeah, no, I know. I know. <laughs> I wanted to do something to give back um, and mm. I felt that, you know, Africa was – something completely different and you know in my mind at the time was when am I ever going to get an opportunity to do something like this after I take on a full-time role so have a go get over there see if you can use your skills and time to make a bit of a difference and um got over there and was just like wow I can't believe how many kids don't have an opportunity to go to school Mm. and the learning facilities that they're learning in are just so poor You know, you've got kids with no shoes on their feet. They don't have desks in front of them. There's 100 kids in a mud hut on the floor. And I'd I'd go in there and I remember I had these, like, crayons, you know, those Zoom crayons. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the kids were just, like, fighting and snatching and I was trying to stop them. But it was just because – and I'm like, oh, my God, they're all snatching. They don't know how to share. Well, it's because they don't have anything, you know. They've never seen a coloured crayon before. So they were excited. It's huge, right? Um, but the real turning point was um, I went over to Tanzania on the way home and I met a woman called Gemma Cecilia who built uh, similar schools to me in Tanzania eight years ahead. And I remember going onto her school grounds and just being like, wow, I am blown away by what she's done. And if she can do it, then I can do it too. <laughs> so literally at the airport, about to fly home, scrapbook out, just writing notes, a sketch of a business plan, how can we help to alleviate poverty through education in Uganda? Who are we going to get in? What's it going to look like? And um, it's really interesting because the business has obviously grown substantially but the model still remains the same. When you were in Uganda and and Kenya and you were seeing these problems, Mm. did you know then you wanted to do something about it or was it not until you went to Tanzania and you saw this is how you can solve that? Yeah, a bit of both. I think critically analysing the way the international development world was being rolled out um, in Uganda and Kenya, I really felt that there was such a Western-led approach. You know, so few people were actually going and working with people to provide them with capacity development opportunities. Mm. It was very much that if the Western organisation was there, then it was a top-down approach. And to me, I just thought how... How are you ever going to change anything when you've got people like me coming in for three months, unskilled, volunteer from uni? You know, I'd, I had a law, I had half a law degree, you know, and a tank full of energy. But I'm not a teacher, mm. you know, so who am I to go in and teach and tell people how to learn? I, I wouldn't have a clue. So I just looked at that and I just thought, wow, you know, there's, this, there's a plethora of resource over in Uganda, a very high level of unemployment. Why aren't people being equipped with the skills that they need to help themselves? Mm. Um, so that that sort of started, that seed started in Uganda and then having flown over to Tanzania and then seeing a model like the School of St Jude's, which was fully formed, mm. you know, showed me what was possible. You start connecting the dots. Yeah. To take a step back, whereabouts are you from? In the <laughs> I'm a country girl. I grew up on a sheep and cattle farm about two hours southwest of Sydney, so just down near Goulburn. Oh, okay. A place called Canyon Lee. Right. Um, quite a large farm, about 2,000 acres. Um, Dad runs sheep and cattle right. and um, mum's a teacher. 
So I kind of, I went to a really tiny primary school. Mm. I only had four kids in my year and 26 kids in the whole school and mum was my teacher. Um, So it was like a K to six composite. Right, right. So I guess um, just grew up around education, but also um, my parents just worked so hard to give me the opportunities that I had. Mm. You know, really went through a lot. Um, when they were first married, dad's dad passed away and he inherited basically a mess. You know, this farm which was in the midst of the worst, one of the worst droughts Australia's ever seen. And he was only 21 himself and his dad passed away from melanoma. So it was all kind of quick. And dad got, dad was starting to be a lawyer at Sydney Uni and dad kind of had to do one of two things, sell the farm and basically break even or go home and make a goal of it. Mm. And so he did everything from droving cattle and sheep down in Gundagai um, through to selling firewood off the back of a trailer to make it work. Anything to make it work. Yeah, and he instilled in me a very hard work ethic, both of them, in fact, mum and dad. You know, they. I think there's something about growing up in the country where you've just got to make it work. Mm. You've just got to find a way. You've just got to find a way. There's no point in kind of lying down and crying about it or giving up because giving up isn't an option. So I think that those values are really instilled in me um, from an early age and then that kind of grew. And I think, you know, that country upbringing, um, we're a bit wild, you know, motorbikes, Mm. Shetland ponies, tree houses. You know, we'd go pigging on the weekends. I've got two older brothers, so they'd push me around a bit and tell me what to do. So I think you you kind of, I grew up in this um, environment where, yeah, I was challenged um, and um, I had extremely strong, hardworking parents Mm. as role models. Yeah. And what did you want to be when you were a kid when you grew up? Um, primarily wanted to work with the UN. The UN? Yeah. Why is that? To help people. And why did you want to help people? I don't know. I think I, I just, I had instilled again, instilled in me the value of service really young. I was, I went to a high school in Mittagong called Frensham and our values there as a school were in love, serve one another. So it was 50% achievement, 50% service. Mm. And they really drove the service. Um, so we participated in heaps of stuff, writing for the disabled, you know, helping out at nursing homes, doing Duke of Edinburgh programs. So I just loved that part of it and I loved the fact of how amazing you feel when you help other people. Mm. And so I remember when I was finishing school, I was thinking about how I could combine that desire to serve others with a career and I said to Dad, oh, I'm going to go off and study to be a social worker. He's like... Right after you finish your law degree. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. yeah. talk to me after you finish yeah. your law degree. Yeah. And I struggled, to be honest. I struggled because I, I am a very, I like to be able to understand the reason for learning something. Right. And I think small town country girl getting thrown into, at the age of 17, thrown into this big sea that is Sydney. Mm. I'd probably only been to Sydney once or twice. Right. And then here I am living, studying law, which really is very conceptual mm. and has a lot of history in it, you know, a lot of a lot of cases and precedents and things. And now I look back and I think, wow, you know, I get it all. Like I understand why contract law is so important. I understand constitutions. And it, it set me up with a great footing. But at the time I was just dragging my feet to uni every day. Yeah. And feeling guilty though, really, because there was this amazing opportunity you know, so many people would kill for the arts law degree at Sydney Uni mm. and here was I, you know, I'd got the marks to do it and um, I just I just struggled with it. Mm. So. And yeah. there's the, what they call it, an incongruency with your identity. Yeah. You wanted to be doing something that felt right but you had to be something else so there was that Exactly. Dis- that yeah, a lot of my girlfriends went to Bathurst as well to study journalism right. and so I kind, and of, I kind of wanted to be there. Yeah. Yeah. What's funny is though how this idea of belonging comes into play. Mm. How there's, there's a saying, it's one of my favourite sayings about this, is in the family of thieves, the son who doesn't steal feels guilty. And what's interesting from what I'm hearing is your dad was a lawyer who dropped out of law, your mum was a teacher, you grew up on a farm, which is all about sustainability mm-hmm. and um, and not overusing what you don't need. Exactly. Right? Yep. And you've taken these ingredients of your character, mm. what made you who you were, 
and they stayed inside you, you kind of like your genetics as you yeah. went through these journeys, and then they started coming out like an epigenetic started coming out once certain things happen once you're exposed to the problem that's right these little parts of you started coming out and go, hey there's an education solution maybe here. there's a that's sta- right. sustainability problem yeah maybe. there's all these all these other things as well so yeah 100%. I, find, I find that it's really interesting, really it? interesting yeah connecting yeah. kind of start connecting those dots yeah no i mean that resonates very well so then tell me this as a country girl who was halfway through a law degree and what would have been 1920 something like I was, when I first went to Africa, I was 20. Okay, and you had this idea. Mm. Um, you had a co-founder? Co-founder, well? yeah. I met him over there, another right. Aussie. Yeah. So we just, we got along like a house on fire. Yeah. And, you know, when we caught up for a drink, when we both got back, we both just had a very similar desire really to help people. Yeah. And it's obviously better to do um, things together than it is on your own. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so there's that. Yeah. And uh, all these worlds of problems that you came across, you found a model, you have an idea, you get a sketchbook out, yep. you find someone in Australia that's equally caring about what you want to do, mm. then what? What's the first thing you do? Oh, it was tricky. Um, it, I guess, so obviously um, you can't just go around asking people for money without fundraising licences. Yeah. So I, um, I registered the organisation, um, which required three directors, so pulled together first a board of directors, yeah. recognising quickly that age was against me. Um, yeah, so 20 years old, what do you know? Pulled in, was lucky to be relatively well networked because wow. of some of the people I nannied for. So I nannied in Mossman in Sydney and a couple of the parents were... High flyers. Mossman, right. Yeah, I mean, one was the ex-CEO of BlackRock in Australia. Um, another one was, um, you know, he's a lawyer, managing partner of one of Australia's biggest law, um, employment law firms. Yeah. So pulled them in, I guess, sold it to them on passion. Yeah. And thank God we did because, you know, if I had have tried to do it my way, I would have tried to build three schools in a year. You know, I think when you're that youthful and naive and passionate, you think... Um, you don't crawl before you walk. Right. So, at what, all. what did you want to do, and what did they steer you? Against? So, I was literally going to just go try build all the schools straight away. Now, of course, I hadn't built financial models or anything, mm-hmm. and I also kind of hadn't really fleshed out just how difficult it is to fundraise. Yeah. So, we all got together and we started to really strategize, and we founded, like, we we registered the organisation, got the fundraising licenses. <laughs> And the reality is fundraising is really tough. Mm. And so um, we needed tax deductibility and you can't just get tax deductibility very easily. So we partnered with Rotary, which is a logical partnership for us given an international project that we were working on. That took in in itself six levels of presentations from local through to district and onwards. Once we got tax deductibility, the doors started to open a bit more because nobody really wanted to donate without being able to get a tax receipt. Right, especially when you're talking to high net worth and then... That's right. We then started talking to basically anyone that would listen Mm. and it wasn't growing as quickly as I'd hoped. So I decided to put on a black tie fundraising ball at the Hilton, uh, promised them 450 guests... Uh, about four weeks out, I think I'd sold 43 tickets, Yeah, literally. <laughs> so what's happening there? I was like, ah. So yeah, just pretty much cried and then called everyone I'd ever met in my whole life. Um, managed to pull in and some, again, profile partnerships, well, how Javianas. Didn't give up? Like, why didn't you sit there and go, I'm not going to do this? No There's way. No chance, four weeks out. I don't no know. Chance. I have this thing and, you know, the board does reverse psychology on me sometimes. Um, if we're struggling with a fundraising initiative, they'll often just tell me to cancel it. Because they know right, that I'll okay. just dig in. Right, okay. I don't know what it is. I hate failure. I hate it. Mm. Failure to me. Failure to me is um, very uncomfortable. Mm. Mm. So I, I kind of will pivot and um, refine to make it work. Right. Um, so you- went to Javiana's and sort of said, you know, um, we're putting on this event which is called a black tie bear football. That was the brand that I'd kind of come up with and um, could you sponsor it because mm. it would be great if we could give everyone a pair of Havies that was coming, um, got Coca-Cola on board, got a few others. I think. Um, but how did you get Havianas and Coca-Cola on board? Was it through the board? I know. I have no um, 
I've no fear about asking people for things. Yeah. So my view is you don't ask, you don't get. And I think where a lot of people in life kind of just coast along is because they actually don't ask for things. Okay. So who did you ask who didn't agree? Oh, gosh. I, I mean, the least, many, yeah. the least would be, I mean, still to this day, I speak to probably one in ten says yes. Mm. You know, the other nine, you know, the, the problem's too big, we're domestically focused, um, you know, you're not a big enough brand, you, you, you name it. Wrong fi- time of the financial year, you name it. Right. You know, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, I just take the opinion that next, like okay. it's okay. Keep, yeah. Just pick yourself up, dust yourself off and keep going. Yeah. Um, and I think over time you you do develop a resilience, you know, you do develop that. That first time though, that first fundraising when you... Probably youthful naivety. I mean, you know, just literally looked up the details of the CEO of Javiana's yeah. in Australia and just was like, I'll just go meet with him. That is awesome. Yeah, and same with Coca-Cola. That was, they've got Asia Pack. Um, I remember having that meeting down in um, Circular Quay. Yeah. And, you know, just asking them to come on board. So... That lifted the profile of the event and before we knew we had 750 people there, we had a waiting list of 200, raised $100,000 that night. And that was your and first time ever doing a yeah, fundraiser. Yeah, and I mean 100000 was a lot for us. Yeah. Um, yeah well. You know, we're now obviously raising over two, a, two million a year, mm. but, but that was a lot and um, that was enough to literally jump on a plane the next day and go over and start the process of acquiring land and building the classrooms. But I mean, I was I was pitching with a with a <laughs> I, I show it in my keynotes because mm. it's quite funny. Just uh, an architect impression of this school that we were going to so build. This is what I see. And yeah. it was it went two ways. People got really excited and thought, "Yeah, we're going to back these young people," or they were kind of like, "Oh, their eyes would glaze over." <laughs> Do you have another one? Come back, yeah, come, <laughs> come back to me when you've grown up yeah. um, or come back to me when you've finished your law degree. And, I mean, for me, um, you know, I, I spoke about sort of struggling through the law degree, but it now had a purpose. Mm. So I was determined to finish it. And You could see how it could yeah, value to something yeah, so bigger much. than what you wanted to do. So much. And you need that, I think, or I need that. I need to be driven by purpose. That's that's really important for me. And. This is your purpose though, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is, I think, the reason I've been put on the earth. So, yeah, it's it's rare to find that. Like, I'm 32 now. Um, you know, for the last 10 years I've been sitting at dinner parties with girlfriends who, you know, are, are really unhappy in what they do. and Trying to work out. Trying to work out what they want to, who they are and what they want to be. And, um, yeah, I was really lucky, I think. Let's go back for a second. You raised the 100 plus thousand dollars at the first ball you are on a high you go back to you again in the next pretty much day yep. you run it high what then uh so we we go and we start really to having deep conversations with the ministry for education and at that point you you know you're not going for three schools anymore right it's, it's well the right. model remains the same but we take baby steps so big vision Small steps. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the, the vision's always been the same. We've actually rolled out what we said we were going to roll out, which is interesting because I think they've been, you know, you can, you, you do adapt business models over time. Yeah. Um, so I remember sitting on the doorstep of the Minister for Education's office for six weeks and I literally bowled up to him in the corridor and he said to me, um, your place isn't here, it's in the home. <laughs> because I'm a female and I was just like oh my god this is insane you know and I just I think I just wore him down eventually (laughs) there's a war of attrition sat there and annoyed him what do you want that's probably been the story of my career is I kind of just wear people down you know I'm always with donors and funders you know they say often they say to you come back to me in three months in three months time I'll come back to you know in three months sometimes it takes you six years to get a donation out of them but You've got to keep that follow up. So yeah, so similarly, I, I basically just stayed there and 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 it really sought advice because again, um, no point in me trying to decide where a school would best be placed in Uganda. Mm. So the ministry identified numerous areas within Uganda that needed schools. So then 
the next step was to acquire land um, and we wanted to own our own land because there are quite a lot of um, disaster stories that you hear about people building on other people's land and then those assets being sold. Mm. Um, so we then had to find the title. Uh, there's no electronic title system in Uganda. It's all paper-based. paper-based. So you got to get signatures, huh? Oh, so and and then probably twenty eight people own twenty eight people the land, oh. and if one person in the family says oh. no, then the deal is off. So I was just like, oh wow. So we found all these blocks of land. Well, anyway, at that point, you're still going. We're doing this. I mean, yeah. I don't care. It's twenty eight people. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I think um, I don't know. Sometimes I feel as though, and I think maybe this is why I love fundraising is that. The challenge is the game. Like it's the thrill You're of the challenge. You're addicted to the challenge because yeah. you every step is is a Being punch. Hard. Yeah, yeah, you're fighting at every step. It's not an easy. Yeah. Okay, here you go. It's everything you get through one fight, and there's another fight straight after it. Yeah, and you keep going for it. Yeah. Okay, so 28 titles. You're going for some signatures. Got it. Finally, got the piece <laughs> of land. So we acquired 10 acres in Uganda. When you do construction, you basically don't have any access to machinery so we hired a bulldozer to help flatten and level the land Mm. for a day and then every single thing was done by hand every foundation that was dug every brick that was pressed on site all the fence posts the toilets which are pit latrines 40 foot deep hand dug so we coordinated a team of local builders um again the capacity side of things we want it to be built by ugandans yeah did you make any mistakes along that way? Did you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we built the school down the hill and then we ended up having to put a retaining wall because the, <laughs> the foundations were being undermined with it when there was rain. Is there, I was going to say, well, who's the engineer that's helping you guys out? No. Yeah, I mean, right. yeah, there was no money. <laughs> right here, know? looks like a good and spot. And that's what I mean. That's what I mean by like I've learned, you know, one thing that I learned was that and now I've terraced my new schools down, you know, down the hill. Um, but even just things, seriously simple mistakes, for instance, there was no guttering accounted for on any of our roof roof space. <laughs> So you've got a literally a roof space that could pretty much capture like a million litres of water a year and there isn't any gutters on that. Oh, no. So just, you know, you sort of sometimes have to reverse engineer things. Yeah. So we built the first classrooms. That took probably, you know, six or eight months. It was a slow process, the first part of it. Yeah. All the while I was – so Dave was there and I was going backwards and forwards trying to raise more funds. It helped when we had some runs on the board – because I think when you're taking an architect's impression at the school yeah. versus here are the children, um, mm. a bright, happy learning environment. But it's more tangible. Yeah, much more. As opposed to before, they were buying you. Literally. So I, I mean, I'm, it's I'm, still... I'm investing in what you, yeah. you can that you can actually deliver this. Yeah. And now that you have delivered something, they go, okay, now I, now I yeah. have some, at least a level of confidence. Yeah. I mean, it never gets easier. I, I always think at every stage that it's going to when it comes to capital raising. Yeah. I think it's one thing to build a school and get that funded. Infrastructure is sexy, yeah. you know. Yeah. A lot of people are like, yeah, great, I can put my name on a library or I can buy a health clinic or very few people are saying, I really want to pay for that teacher's salary. Mm. There's a bit of a um, psyche that I, I guess potentially from some of the big guys in the media getting in trouble for high administrative overheads and then there tends to be a bit of a psyche of, well, I don't want to pay for anyone's salary. Yeah. And it's like, but this is a school, you know, you're better off paying for the teacher who's going to have a ripple effect onto all of these children than mm. you are to pay for the bricks and mortar. You know, I believe that a good teacher can teach under a tree. Yeah. So it's just changing that. It's education as well. So you get that first school up, yep. beautiful, and then now you're at three schools. So, yeah, there's a bit of a gap in there, but, yeah, so it's probably seven years. Seven-year gap. So tell me. So first okay. school's built. Um, because then, it took you two years to get the first school and then seven years to get the first three, three for the first. And then um, so we opened in 2011 yep. with the first two classrooms. The school was complete in 2013. Okay. So in 14, <laughs> um, we started looking for more capital. Now, I'm a big believer in partnerships mm. and I knew that the Cotton On Foundation were doing a substantial amount of work in Uganda. So I approached them to broker a partnership whereby they would um, help fund the next two schools. 
and they took it and ran with it and said, yeah, we'll do it. So they gave us 1.15 million US dollars over three years. Yep. So that construction started in 2015 um, and it's just about to be finished now so that's the second and the third schools so that was an amazing kind of leapfrog for us yeah but any kind of giant funding um, it is a double-edged sword because we've undertaken growth uh, very rapidly we went from having 200 kids and eight teachers to 680 kids and 46 teachers and running not only two primary schools but also a secondary school. So engineering the team around the that. growing pain in that time. Yeah. So you, and then on your end, how did you On handle? my end, the operational yeah. overheads just absolutely blew. Mm. So that's been and continues to be my, my biggest challenge at the moment, exponential kind of capital growth, but then keeping up and um, making sure that the operational growth can sustain what we've created. We've still only taken about another 120 students per annum um, and we're flexible on that. If, yeah. if we had a rainy day, we could take, say, 40 or none. Yeah. Yeah. In that growth phase that you've had and the management of the growth phase, where have you made a mistake? Do, do you have you got an hour, two hours? <laughs> All the time in the world. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, I think one of the big ones is I can tend to be reactive versus proactive. That kind of has meant that I've just quickly bring people into the business where I see a problem. I'm a, I'm a bit of a fixer. Um, I tend to go quickly into fix-it mode. So sometimes that's meant um, that I, I probably haven't really – sat through the pain and uncomfortability of sort of being a bit over my head, mm. trying to pull people in to sort of help fix things. That's meant sometimes that I haven't brought the right people in. And then on top of that, I think there's, again, hasty growth and particularly with the capital sometimes, for instance, like right now I've got a secondary school where only one block is powered by solar and it's very difficult to run a secondary school without electricity. Yeah. And it's also, we are so far off the beaten track having um, connectivity issues. So we don't have any internet. And so now we're starting to move into this phase of delivering secondary education and now trying to reverse engineer um, some of the systems. Uh, systems and processes really is the yeah. big one where we're sort of not making mistakes, but even just with CRMs and, yeah. you know, you start implementing all of these systems and, yeah. Just... Well, so you're you're reacting to these new problems as they come and yeah. you're doing your best you can with it. and Firefighting, okay. really. Yeah. Firefighting. Yeah. Let's go back to the reactive problem where you're finding these gaps and you're trying to put bodies on the ground to solve it. And yeah. sometimes those bodies aren't the right ones to be yeah. there. Uh, what are you doing to mitigate or manage the outcome of that, knowing that this is one of your quick areas. Yeah, so areas. just we just had two volunteers come over from Macquarie Bank mm. um, to do a few full organisation review. Right. You sometimes, it often I think in business, you need to bring in people with very independent eyes. Yeah. And they can see it for what it is and sometimes they hold a mirror up to your face that isn't that comfortable to look at. Mm. And certainly for me, I remember when they were first, um, so they did two weeks without me in Uganda and then they did three weeks with me. And I remember I cried for the first three nights because they pull holes in the business, you know, and they're not huge holes. Yeah, but, but they're super. Yeah, and, and then you feel like I'm a failure, you know, I've done these things wrong or we've done this in haste and it's not working. So, for instance, one, you know, a couple of the big mistakes have been that we've tried to create some commercial businesses over in Uganda but we haven't clearly defined the purpose of these businesses. Mm. So an example is that we've put up a piggery. The piggery is connected to biogas digesters. So the waste goes down and into these biogas digesters and the gas is then used for cooking. Now, when we set out, we weren't clear about why we wanted the piggery. Mm. Was it to um, mitigate feeding costs of our children because we feed our kids three meals a day? So was it that? Was it to actually make money? And then if it was to make money, was there even a market, you know? So it sounded like a really great idea when I was 22, let's have a piggery, it's going to be connected to these biogas digesters. The problem is these pigs are organically fed. Mm -hmm. They are not well sought after in Uganda. You know, some of the Western restaurants want them. 
that we're only running a hundred head. We're not running a thousand. And most of them want to buy the meat dressed. And right. I don't want to run an abattoir. Right. You know, we run schools. So I think there's been over time a few things like this where there's been a bit of mission creep. So our core focus is the delivery of quality education. But then it's a bit exciting and the entrepreneur in me thinks, yeah, yeah, let's just run this little side business. It'll generate some income. And, yeah, you have to jump on these things when they're not working. Yeah. Um, so that that's just a small example. Another one is our women's tailoring business. Again, it was set up as a vocational training centre. What ended up happening was that we were marketing and selling goods here in Australia. Now the women then, 20 women were trained then they started getting some orders through and then they just, it wasn't really, didn't become a vocational training centre. It became an employment opportunity for uh, them. Right. So they weren't rotated out of the program. So we didn't then say, okay, so that's your vocational training done. Off you go and get a job. So now I've got 20 women who have had an opportunity to gain an employment right. opportunity, but then what happens to the other women? So really it's a business, not a vocational training program. Mm. So I guess making some of these decisions without having really strong um, expectations mapped out at the outset for what is the purpose of these projects, that's probably been one of the things that um, we've really tightened down on. And then just re-identifying, you know, what we're delivering and how we're delivering it. Are we doing it as efficiently and effectively as possible? And, and for me, I'm, I'm standing here across the table from a donor and I want to know that 100% that I'm doing the right thing and the most efficient thing with their money. So just clamping down on some stuff. Mm. Yeah, it's not easy. No, it doesn't sound very easy. It's not easy. easy. You're dealing with humans' lives. Um, and in Uganda, there's a huge level of unemployment. So the last thing you really want to be doing is letting go of people. Mm. But on the flip side of it, you also need to ensure that there's accountability around everything that you do. So, yeah, so it's been a transition and it's certainly letting go of some things, you know. It's also for me moving from being the doer into the manager and that's hard. That's hard for a perfectionist. Yeah. Yeah. And for someone who's been so close to it for so long. Definitely. How, how have you struggled with that? I'm, I'm struggling with it right now. I've got my ball next weekend and it's, you know, um, so now that's nine years on, it raises about 500,000, <laughs> you know, but, but I'm still the one who's, you know, proof in the programs and, you know, because, final cut. yeah, I want the yeah. final cut. Yeah. You just have to learn. I think sometimes I get so busy that I have to let go. Yeah. I guess the best thing is um, making sure that you have strong accountability and KPIs with your team yep. and making your expectations clear up front because I think when you don't do that, that's when you get into trouble. And I've never led like that before. Mm. So even for me, it's new. Like I just always expect that people just do their job and do it really well. Yeah, how does that work out? Uh, <laughs> mixed success. Yeah, mixed success, right. <laughs> mixed success. To get to this place where you've done so well, you've got these schools that you said you are going to, to build and you've built them. Yep. You've got the Order of Australia. You've got all these little <laughs> these fantastic awards. But yeah. they, they do mean a lot of things. They do, um, yeah. Regardless of if... Yeah, I you, still struggle with that one, to be honest. Regardless of if you celebrate the success of them or not. Yes. The fact is people are recognising them and they see what you do, which is which is amazing. To get to where you have has taken a lot of passion, as you said, passion that a lot of people don't have and wish they do have. What did you sacrifice, though? What have you sacrificed? Oh, everything. Do? Yeah. No, not it. I mean, look, it's it's a tricky one because I've sacrificed a lot, but I've also, in my view, I, I guess I don't see it as sacrifice because I am so deeply engaged in what I do. I mean, I probably haven't had the normal 20-year-old 20 to 30 year olds lifestyle and I'm I, I'm not sort of saying that I, I've sort of wanted for heaps either in the sense that you know I mean I've certainly had the best of both worlds because I am backwards and forwards between Australia and Uganda but I don't know many 20 year olds who are working between an 80 and 100 hour week you know from that for that long um so yeah look I've sacrificed a bit and I think you know it kills me when people say that I threw away my law degree because that is just so not true. Like I, I didn't. I'm using my law degree every day and I'm using it to help other people. So I think I'm not actually throwing that away. But, I mean, the sacrifices are big. I work every weekend. You know, it's hard to, you know, have my personal life um, as a priority. It's not a priority. You know, I, I spend a lot of time 
working and and not a lot of time kind of socializing my family is very important to me and, I, and that's my priority as well but yeah I mean it, it's it is there's a layer of responsibility and stress there that just doesn't go away um, much like a university degree that kind of hangs over your head so yeah look there's been sacrifices but I, I believe they're all worth it I go to Uganda five times a year and when I step off that plane I just go wow you know, the late nights and, and the sort of early mornings and, you know, some of the really tough decisions, they're worth it because these are people's lives that are being changed. How do you make that decision? If it's a decision between maybe you having to spend time with the family on a weekend when you haven't seen them in six months or stay back at work because there's war coming up, how do you manage that in your head? I know this sound, probably doesn't sound right, but I think if they're just there, there's only ever been school for life in a lot of ways in the sense of I just do what it takes to get it done so I'm pretty fast um, operator so I can do quite a few things quickly but by the same token yeah I mean I don't know I just um, I guess when you're doing what I do I, it comes with a certain level of forgiveness you know I think a lot of people go okay well she's yeah she's working hard for other people so yeah but I don't know how, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how you reconcile that really are you proud of what you do? Very, yeah. I love it. I love it. It's um, it's a gift really to be able to do what I do, I think, and to be able to get up every day with a really strong purpose. It's funny though because I've been doing it for so long, I don't even know what it feels like to not think about charity. So often when, you know, I know when you came in last week and we're chatting a little bit about I'm so deeply embedded in what I do that I don't even think that other people don't think about charity every day. Yeah, it's just like what? <laughs> You're not facing the same problem? <laughs> so, yeah, so sometimes I have to try and bring myself back out of that as well. Yeah. You know, and, and go, okay, it's, well, yeah, it's, it's not fun. Yeah. yeah, it's everything. Yeah. yeah. It's everything. And are you proud of yourself? Yeah, I am. I mean, yeah, I'm proud of myself, but there's a lot of growing I've got to do. You know, the business has grown so quickly and I'm learning, you know. I'm mm. making mistakes. I'm learning because I'm I'm not perfect and I never will be, but I also have a very hybrid role Mm. you know it's not kind of just a flat ceo role like business development and strategy that's just such a small component there's also just all the cultural things and the relationships that i've built which is so deep over time and then there's the fact that there's the fundraising and there's the operations of everything so i guess when you're running a small business as well you do you have your finger in a lot of pies and i try to be everything to everyone and Mm. i've got to learn to stop doing that so much yeah yeah did you celebrate when you got the three schools um i mean the third school's only just about to be finished yeah, we do. We celebrate every time we complete a school. Mm. But I think you just get so bogged down in the issues, the day-to-day issues that you're dealing with. And it's just dealing with so many things that you just don't think you're going to have to deal with in your life. Yeah. Just strange, you know, obviously I'm operating schools in Uganda. So yeah. culturally it's completely different. And every time I've got calls with the Uganda side, I'm just kind of mind blown by the sorts of things that we're having to deal with. And, of course, then it's schools and it's kids and it's people's lives. So there are all these extra layers of complexity. It's not just really the product of what we do is social. And so, one, I'm kind of selling this social product, which is at the end of the day I can give you an engagement, a tax receipt, and maybe, you know, some form of feel-good factor, but I can't really give you anything for your money I'm just giving, you're giving to me because you trust me to do what I do best with it, which is Mm. go build schools and run them. And so you've got that first level of challenge. And then when you get there and you're on the ground, you've got this extra kind of layers of challenges, which is dealing with very, very big obstacles, gender-based violence. You've got a curriculum that's delivered in English when the kids don't speak English at home. You've got kids who are coming to school age three and four who've never even seen a pen or pencil before, never done up a shoelace on their shoes because they've never owned a pair of shoes. So it's just all of these, you know, it ebbs and flows in which kind of part of the business needs me more because Uganda's obviously very operational. Australia's more strategic and fundraising and we can't do anything if we don't have money. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it makes for never a dull day because, I mean, the first sort of 50 to 60% of my day is spent on operating the Australian side and then 
you know, eight hours later, Uganda kicks off and then I'm starting to have calls with the Uganda right. side. And so you're in a different time zone, you're not in yeah. different proximity, so you can't get dive into a problem with your hands on nah. without flying. You have to have good leaders. You have to have good managers. Yeah. Um, how'd, and you, how'd you work that out? Making mistakes. Right. I'm still, <laughs> I, you know, I still make them. It's, I, I find the single biggest challenge managing people. Yeah. Because they're not predictable and you can't put them in a cookie cutter. Yeah. You know, you can't treat everyone the same so, way and expect to get the same result. And that level of unpredictability is really yeah. scary. Where, where did you first, where do you have a, do you have an experience of when you that that first became a, a realization for you that people are not going to do what I expect them to always do? First person I hired. Yeah. Oh God. It's so hard, and it's so hard because, particularly when it's your own business, they don't care as much as you do. And they never will, and, and I don't think they should either. Though. I mean, neither. You, 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 I start off thinking that way. I mm. did. I was like, well, they should care about it as much as I can. But why would they? It's your baby. Yeah. Who's ever going to care about your your baby as much as what you do? Yeah, that's They're right. Not. So, you, and I then suppose. and then you go through as a founder, then you go through these stages of having to try and let go. Yeah. And I mean, for me, the first hire was not the right fit. Um, one, I hired too quickly. You know, I hired because there was no one else out there that I could afford right. and I took what I could get and I had a gut feeling that it was wrong. Mm. And I, I swear in HR and kind of recruitment and stuff over time, you know, your gut is everything. If you have even an odour of doubt, yeah. do not hire. Yeah. Do not just wait, you know, and I know it feels because for me it's always like, oh, but we need someone now, you yeah. know. But it doesn't pay off. Right. Your mind's going the one way and then you can't yeah. say the other way. Like, oh, I think she so this guy was good in the sense that he was really passionate. But um, sort of um, could sort of sell ice to Eskimos. Right. And, you were... and was making promises that we just dead set could not deliver on. You're right. And so I'd go into meetings with these potential corporate partners and he'd be selling it like a road show. You know, this is school for life and this is what we can do. Yeah. Here's our portfolio right. of opportunities. And I'm like, oh, my God, we can't. Right. So There's fresh no... off the car lord, he comes in there. Stuff, Literally, so. it was right. like a car dealer, yeah. um, promised the world. And so I – and then – but then it started that, you know, straight away, I want more money. Want more money. So I was paying him more than myself. Never do that. Ever, ever, ever. Yeah. And the board of my board of directors said to me, don't do it. And I went against them because I was so desperate for somebody to help me with the fundraising that I was thinking to myself, it, it, this, it, this is a better investment. You know, I'm happy to right. take, I'm happy to take less money yeah. to hire somebody to give me more help because I need help so much. So you'll be the sacrificial lamb for this. Yeah, they said, they said, don't do it. I did it. Yeah. Um, and you inherently build. Um, you don't mean to, but you inherently do build a little bit of resentment, mm. I think. And, you know, I'm not, I, I think obviously with what, what I do, you can tell, you know, I'm not doing this for money. I could be in a law firm earning yeah. a six-figure salary from the age of 24 and yeah. I didn't do that. But I think the reality of it is is that you do have to value yourself and the founder is always going to work 20 to 50% harder mm. than any staff member. And so then when you remunerating somebody more than you're on yourself. Yeah. It's just stupid. Yeah. I shouldn't have done it. And the board helped me with that. That's good. You know, they, they were the ones jumping in going, you need to be paid a salary after five or six years of volunteering. And I was like, no, no, let's just pay for somebody else to be employed. Um, you can't. You can't be the sacrificial lamb. You can't. And, and the thing is, is, you know, some people still nearly every week ask me, do you get paid a salary or do you do this full time? It's a... It's more than a full-time job. So. <laughs> One full-time job? Full-time job? Right. But, um, yeah, and at the end of the day, a charity is a business. Mm. You know, it's a business and, oh, yeah. uh, and it needs to be run commercially like a business. And I think that's, you know, one of the big things that I'm most passionate about mm. is we will run effective and efficient operations and it will be run like a business. You know what appealed to me? One thing you've got on your website that appealed straight to me is we don't do handouts, we mm. do hand-ups. Yeah. The um, conscious capitalism side of that is, yeah. to me rings exactly my little entrepreneurial mm-hmm. bells in my head. Just go, I love that. I love that yep. idea that you're empowering someone yep. to do what they could be fully capable of doing. Oh, exactly. This is and as a in a business mindset, I'm not giving away something. I'm investing into something. 
That's and I'm right. going to see the dividends pay off in different ways. That's right. And I'm backing something. Mm-hmm. So I love that mentality that you guys, yeah. guys have in this. Oh, it's so it's important. Awesome. I think, um, yeah, you teach a man to fish. Yeah. You know, it gives him the skills. Yeah. So there's no point. I mean, we've seen it in Australia. We've seen it across the whole developing world. Mm. Welfare is incredibly disempowering. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. you'll never, ever see me give a dollar to anyone, ever. It's just not the way we work. Yeah. Um, that's not going to help them. And one of the things we started off talking about was how hard it is for you to celebrate success. Mm. Yeah, it is. It's hard because um, there's always something else that needs to be focused on. Yeah. You know? So it's being on the farm and getting on with something else. Get on with it. Get on with it. Yeah, I just remember, you know, Dad's pretty Dad's pretty tough. Mm. You know, he's, he's a strong guy and he's, you know, you just get up and get on with it. You know, you don't take a sick day or, yeah. you know, you don't kind of wallow if, if something's happen to you you hook in mm. and you get it done so and what does dad think of you <laughs> dad's funny dad's very proud now um it was a challenge it was a challenge my parents are conservative um people and for their little girl to go over and build schools in uganda that um that was a challenge for them so we let her go to sydney and now look what happened seriously what and then you do? i remember the first three years was almost like you know when's she going to get over it yeah. When's she going to just go get a real job, you know? And um, it just didn't go away. <laughs> if anything, it got bigger. It's, they just had to accept it like yeah. everyone else with you. Yeah, and in 2013 oh, they came over and, yeah, Dad pretty much just cried and, yeah. What was that moment like? Cathartic. So, so to see your dad, the strong man. Yeah, cathartic. And yeah. it's amazing. Um, you know, now he's, yeah, he's so engaged. And not that he wasn't before. I think it was just it was just a hard concept you know, a hard concept to understand and, and in some ways degrees and education equal money and income mm. in a very traditional sense and maybe for the baby boomers. And so that was sort of they weren't marrying, you know, obviously like I had this amazing education and, and I wasn't using it to, to mm. generate an income. So but no, now... Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're really on board. They're, they're championing everything you do. They are. Sharing it everywhere they can. <laughs> they Telling are. The friends that yeah, like we along. opened the secondary school last year and they came along to that as well, so that was good. That is so good. Yeah, cool. but it's, yeah, I mean. Your face just lit up. As soon as, as, soon as you said how happy <laughs> your parents were, you're like, ah. They are. They're hilarious. My brothers, are, yeah, everyone's, I've got an amazing family. So That is so good. Okay, I've got two last questions. I didn't even use sure. my paper, which is No which is worries. Good. If tomorrow you had a child, but you could give them no money, no assets, no name or network, what three characteristics would you want them to have? Generosity, kindness, and a spark, you know, like mm. an energy. I don't know whether yeah. that's an asset. But yeah, 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 but yeah. You know, like that they need thing. to have something in, you know, they've got to get get up and go. Why do you say that? I just think, you know, Why you can't three? just drift yeah. through life. Mm. Uh, you can't drift through life and expect things to be handed on you to you on a silver platter. You've got to work for them. Mm. Um, and it doesn't matter if that's commercial, not-for-profit, whatever, you know, you, you don't just get handed things on a platter. And then I think you just need to incorporate service into every facet of what you do. You know, we are in an incredibly privileged position to be born in a country like Australia or to be living in a country like Australia. Yeah. And we have so much that we, you know, at times I think can take for granted. So you do need to sort of think about others. And, and I think the value of service is a strong one for me just in that you get so much more in return yeah. as well. So, yeah, those would be the key ones. It's when the man stops looking at the mirror and looks beyond the mirror that he starts finding the, the rewards. Exactly. You've got yeah. some good ones. I need, yeah. need to do some reading. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just look up quotes. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, it's good though. Last one then. If I could be you and could walk in your shoes over the last five years, what would you tell me to watch out for? Ooh. <sighs> I don't know if I can even answer that. It's really tricky. Probably, really probably yourself. Mm. You know, I know that sounds a little bit selfish, but I think you do need to protect yourself when you're undertaking significant business growth and professional growth and managing a bunch of people. Because I think if you're not good for yourself, you're not good for other people. And it's taken time for me to recognise that. Mm. You know, sometimes um, over the last 12 months really I've, I've sort of there's been times when I've walked into the office and I'm just like I'm just not 
feeling it like I'm in a bad headspace right now um, to be sort of thinking big and, you know, having energy for other people and, and all of that. And I think the best thing that I've ever done is is walk away that day and because I come back 10 times stronger, yeah. you know. So I think – and then the other one is just, you know, just continuing to surround yourself with people who lift you higher. Yeah. Yeah, so. What's been in your headspace? What brings you down? Um, I think there's just a lot of noise. So we've grown from growth into we're now pushing into a sustainability model. And if I'm going to make this thing sustainable forever, what does that look like? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I spoke earlier about the fact that I've got a very big growth mentality. You know, for me it's hard to reconcile that I may not be able to educate 5,000 kids. Mm-hmm. It might be 1,600 and I do it really well and I do it for a long time. But I guess trying to sort of get my own mindset into the idea that quality is better than quantity as long as it's delivered sustainably. So it's been a shift for me. You know, I think I thought that I would have done more by now. Um, And, you know, I still wish that and and maybe I will do more schools or I will do more, but it's just re-measuring what success looks like for me and it doesn't need to be about numbers. It can be about quality and it can be about sustainability. Yeah. They are equally, if not more, important. So it's taken a bit for me to get my head around that, I think. What made you have to think differently? Well, our growth was so fast that I needed to try and find basically about $1.6 million per annum. So still 50% was being pumped into capital. So, but we're talking now, we're running on about a $700,000, $800,000 budget. And I guess when you're looking, sitting across the table from people every day asking them for money, you are vulnerable. Like I know I say, you know, I just ask. I do just ask and and certainly... Um, I've got no problem doing that. But there are a lot of knockbacks and there are times when you get 10 knockbacks in a row and you think, geez, this is tough. Like, am I going to come out of this? Mm. And then, you know, some golden goose will come in and everything will sort of, but sometimes that that adrenaline, you know, you're sort of just running on, are we going to be able to make budget this month Mm. or this year? That's been hard for me. And as I say, having to build in, people into my team that I can trust and I can pass things on to and letting go. Yeah. That's hard. It's the vulnerability. Very. For someone who's had to be strong for so much and, yeah. and had that thick skin. I'm hugely vulnerable. vulnerable, really. I mean, it's, you know, I think we all are. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you, you know, there's nothing like walking around um, with three schools and 680 kids' futures on your shoulders. You know, this this has got to work. It has to. It's got to work. Yeah. Come hell or high water, we've got to make this work. So I guess at times that pressure can be pretty overwhelming. Yeah. Um, and hence the sustainability. How can we develop more strategies around regular income? So is that how you got to that, that the, yeah. the, the pressure of having to constantly try to ask for money and say it has to be a more sustainable way, and even if it means we don't have as many schools but quality that's right. improved it means the well-being of the whole ecosystem that we're creating is better that's right and it's about not over promising and under delivering because i think that's that is failure really you know i would never want to walk into a community and say we're going to provide 5000 education positions at our school and then you know the next day we shut shop because i haven't been able to manage that yeah. so it's incremental growth now um and going back inwards of the business and engineering what's going to take us forwards. Sometimes you've got to stop and reanalyse and that's sort of where we've been yeah. over the last 6 to 12 months and sometimes that's not comfortable. Well, actually, it's not comfortable at all, but, but um, it's certainly vital and, and I recommend it, yeah. you know. I recommend that you've, you've got to evaluate everything that you do. Do you have any advices, any, anything that get, allows you to escape from the pressure? Uh, I'm into fitness. I do a lot of running. I do a lot of, um, like, go to the gym and stuff. So I love that. No, not really. I don't. I'm I'm pretty. I sleep. Yeah, I sleep. Good. Yeah, yeah. Like on the weekend, I'll I'll smash a 14 hour sleep and re-energize for for the week. Yeah. So no, not hugely. I'm. uh, I love a drink, but nothing too savage. (laughs) There's a country girl coming out. (laughs) 
Yeah, it'll yeah. Be, be down the uh, long neck. Down the hatchet. That's it. <laughs> okay, uh, so where can people find you online? And if they want to help with School for Life, uh, what can they do? Yeah, so they can jump onto our website. It's um, schoolforlife.org.au. Mm. Um, best way of supporting is by sponsoring a child. So um, it's $42 a month to provide a child with three meals every day, shoes, uniforms, books, teachers, clean water and health care. So that's probably the best way wow. of getting involved. It's yeah. Cheap. Yeah, cheap I mean, for us, right? yeah, it's crazy. It's less than a dollar a day. That's awesome. <laughs> I should say, well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And that concludes the episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Annabelle Chauncey is something else, isn't she? Just makes you want to do something great in the world. If you liked that episode as much as I did, it would be great if you could jump on however you listen to podcasts, iTunes or whatever. Hit the subscribe button. Give us a five-star rating if you feel like it's worth a five-star rating. And if you have any feedback for me, it's hard for me to gauge how well this thing is going. I know there's a few things I need to work on. Or if there's any guests you want me to reach out to, find me on Instagram at FabXIII. That's the 13 in Roman numerals. Or go to the website at www.scartissuepodcast.com. Hit the contact page and uh, send us a little message there. Till next time, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. <music>